Hey everyone, welcome back. This is chapter 12 covering the IT Fundamentals Plus all-in-one exam guide to prepare you for the U61 uh, all, uh, IT Fundamentals exam by CompTIA. Uh, we are on chapter 12, which covers computer maintenance and management. Uh, unlike the last couple chapters, which had a lot of content, this one will not take as long and do because it doesn't have as many objectives and doesn't have as much content in this chapter. However, still very critical to make sure you know prior to taking the IT Fundamentals Plus U61 exam. Our chapter objectives for chapter 12 is that we will learn how to manage power usage. We will understand how to clean and maintain hardware. We will know how to dispose of computer equipment responsibly, as well as know how to recover and prevent uh, and preventative measures for computer disasters. So the first thing that we're going to talk about here in chapter 12 is power management basics. Now, one of the first things that you should do, whether it becomes a, whether it's a computer or really any kind of electrical um, object, is that we want to choose energy efficient devices. Uh, energy efficient devices will have a central converse, conservation and savings. And we want to choose devices with this logo, which is called the Energy Star logo. These are devices that use less energy overall and have special energy conservation features. Uh, this really will help with your electricity bill, plus it will also help your device to last longer. So it's always great. It does sometimes cost a little bit more in and up front when you purchase the item. However, these are starting to become more and more um, normal in terms of devices that you buy that they are going to be ENERGY STAR efficient. We also want to avoid always on computing. When we're talking about electronic devices that are computers, whether it be a laptop or a workstation or a, um, or a phone or a tablet, we want to make sure we always avoid always on computing. Uh, for a desktop, if you leave your desktop on, um, let's say an entire year without ever shutting it off, it's going to cost anywhere from two to $300 extra than if you would have would have turned it off. For a laptop, uh, again, always on devices are gonna be up to $65 per year, extra money that you're paying for the electricity to, uh, to keep these on. Now, it's not a lot of money, but it's also gonna help with the wear and tear of your computer. Whenever you leave your computers on, it is going to generate a substantial amount of heat, which is, as we know, is one of the two enemies of computers. The other one is wetness or moisture. Um, and it also is going to, for a laptop, it will drain your battery if it's not plugged in. So we want to make sure that we always uh, avoid always on computing. Plus, every now and then restarting your computer is going to help kind of wipe it clean and help give it the restart um, that it needs to be able to be more efficient for you. Now, if you're not doing always on computing, what are our options? Now, one of the first options is for a low power mode is just simply to shut it down. Whenever you're doing it, whenever you're done with the computer for the day or whenever you're going to sleep, you should shut the computer down. It will, it will not cause any kind of wear and tear. It will give the system and the case fans a rest from running. Uh, it will prevent all those issues that we talked about in the previous slide. It is sometimes inconvenient, though, because whenever you're ready to use the computer, it will have the slowest startup time. Uh, so instead of shutting it down, which, again, I still recommend that you do that every now and then, you do have some other low power mode options. So some other options instead of shutting it down is one is sleep. Uh, so whenever you put a computer to sleep, what it will do is it will power the memory within the computer, but it shuts down all other components. Uh, it uses very little power. The laptop will last about a day in this mode if it's not plugged in. And also the nice thing about sleep is that it has a quick response to work. It takes just a few seconds to resume where you were. Another option for a low power mode is hibernate. Uh, it's important to make sure you know the difference between sleep and hibernate when it comes to the computer te uh, terminology. Hibernate copies the memory to a hard drive and then powers off, excuse me, powers off all components. It, putting a computer in hibernate uses absolutely no power. There is no time limit for how long a computer is in Hibernate because it's kind of like it was shut down. However, the nice thing about Hibernate is that it only takes about 15 seconds to resume. It does take a little bit longer than what sleep does, 
but it's much quicker than just completely shutting down your computer. Uh, it is, uh, again, the difference between sleep and hibernate, sleep powers the memory, but shuts down all other components, but your memory is still going strong, and so it uses a little bit of electricity for that. But for hibernate, it copies the memory to the hard drive and then shuts everything down. And on the screen, you can see on the bottom of the first column is, is how you can put things into hibernate mode. Now, Hibernate is not available in all the computers, and it also doesn't work well in all computers. So you'll just have to kind of check with your computer to see if it does have a Hibernate mode, play around with it, and see if how well that, that works for you. Now, if when you're using your computer, you also have some power plans that can help you be able to um, have the best performance as possible, uh, but also possibly save some battery life, especially when you're talking about a laptop. Now, there's three kinds of power plans that you can use. There's a high performance, performance mode, there's a balanced mode, and there's a power savings mode. High performance mode means that you want the best possible efficient uh, computer right now, and you want to use all the power to for the processing power, for the screen brightness, for everything that you want to do, you want the best possible performance. However, a highest performance will drain your battery the most. You also have, uh, I'm going to jump down to power savings. You also have a power savings power plan, which conserves the most power and battery life. Things will not be as quick, your screen will not be as bright, but your battery will last longest. And then between those two, between high performance and power savings, you have balanced. Balance is kind of like the moderate power savings. It's gonna give you a little bit of power, it's gonna give you, uh, I'm sorry, a little bit of performance, it's gonna save a little bit of power. It's not the best in either category, but it's a nice balancing there. Um, and it also will help your uh, screen to sleep quicker and it will drive sleep a little slower. Now there's some custom ones that you can do and you can play around with the different settings in your control panel for where the power options are displayed, which is where you would find these power plans. Some other custom ones that you could possibly do, again, you can edit any plan to make it tweak for your hardware, tweak it for the performance and cost balance that you wanna do, so again, what it's going to give you, it gives you some default settings that you can use, but you can always go in and tweak it and edit it and customize it for you. Now, another nice thing that you can do, especially when it comes to a laptop uh, and also for a desktop, is when you push the power button, what do you want to happen? Most of the time when you press a power button, it turns the computer on. But what happens when it's already on? Well, you have some customization um, options that you can do with that. If it's a power button option, when you press the power button, you can make it shut down. You can make it go to sleep. You can make it hibernate. You can make nothing happen. If you've got a little rug rat running around, and he's always pushing the power button on your tower. You can make it so that nothing happens, or you can turn off the display. There's a lot of different options on all that. As you can see here in this graphic here in the system settings for, for power options, when I press the power button, when it's on a battery, what do I want it to do? When it's plugged in, what do I want it to do? And so this is where you would customize that. You can also, for a laptop, what do you want, it to, ha what do you want to happen when you close the lid? Do you want the computer to shut down, to go to sleep, to hibernate, or again, nothing? So you can change these on here. Most computers also have a sleep button. It kind of looks like a, um, kind of like a moon. Um, in possibly the function buttons where you'd have to hit function and then that, that button. On my computer, it's function insert. Uh, I press the function button and insert and it would put it into a sleep mode. And if you don't have to have make that be sleep mode, you can make, change it to whatever you want. Now, one thing that's very important and this helps maintain your computer to make it last the longest is to clean and maintain your hardware. So we want to keep our computer as clean as possible. And for the most part, it does stay clean, depending on what environment it's in. But uh, ultimately, some things might get built up with some cobwebs or some, uh, some things inside of, the, inside of the case. So it, again, it's very important to make sure you have the proper cleaning materials whenever you clean, whether it be the tower, whether it be the monitor, whether it be a laptop, uh, your phone, a tablet, and so on. If your computer is typically in a clean environment, we're gonna go ahead and assume that that would be your home, that would be a regular office building and so forth, you would wanna get a soft cloth 
which is called microfiber. There's a special kind of cloth out there called microfiber, and you'd want to get that. And you can find a cleaner specifically for monitors or for electronics. And you would spray the cleaner directly on the cloth, not on the electronic itself. Very important uh, because we don't want that the extra moisture to seep down into some cracks where they shouldn't go. So you spray it just a little bit on your uh, on your cloth and then you would wipe down whatever you need to wipe down. They also have, um, you could also get a vacuum cleaner um, and for you know just the outside of the hardware and this is just a regular vacuum cleaner. You wouldn't have to do anything fancy for that. But if you're just trying to use a brush to brush out you know, the outside of your case or the outside of your laptop, it's, that's, that's totally fine. When you get inside of your case or inside your laptop, you would not want to use a regular vacuum cleaner because the electricity, the static electricity that, that's going on with all that could wreak some havoc with some of your internal components. If you have a dirty environment, and we would say maybe like an auto shop or other places where there, it's kind of greasy or dirty, um, then we would wanna use just mild soap and water to do this. Uh, you don't need these special cleaners because it might be more aggressive grime that you need to um, remove. So you'd wanna use mild soap and water solution on any kind of external component. Do make sure you unplug everything before you do wipe anything down. And you don't need a lot of water, just a little bit of water, just a little bit of moisture, but enough that you can uh, kind of scrub hard and get some dirt off of your computers. And you do wanna make sure you allow enough time to dry thoroughly. And you would want it to air dry. Just let it set aside, let it air dry in a nice place, and then it's ready to use when it's drying. For specifically monitors, as I mentioned, they have special cleaner for a monitor. And as I mentioned already, we want to use a damp, soft cloth uh, or mild soap and water, depending on what your environment is. And then you, you put it directly on the rag. You spray the cleaner on the cloth and then you wipe. Again, do not spray directly on a screen or on any kind of external component because we don't need stuff leaking in with the moisture. For removal media, which is like a disc, or a flash drive or other things that you could possibly take out. You would use a microfiber cloth and again, damp is fine. Um, but, and the weird thing is about a disc is if you look at a disc, it's kind of like a record where it's the, the, the lines are going in a circular motion. But for a disc, you actually want to brush it from outside, from, excuse me, from inside straight out from the middle of the disc out to the edge of the disc. You never wanna brush around in a clockwise or counterclockwise motion. You wanna go from middle out, middle out, and do that all the way around the disc. It seems counterintuitive, but that is the best way to clean a removable media without damaging it. When you're ready to clean inside the PC, you might have a lot of, again, uh, cobwebs or dirt or grime that have built up over the, over the years inside of your PC. First thing you have to do is you have to figure out, you know, how can I protect the internal components from electrostatic discharge from my body or other elements that you're using? Uh, how do I make sure that I don't have any spills that happen inside when I open it up? And the, the biggest question is how do I open up this case? Opening a PC is different by each model. There's not a there's not a, uh, a, a one way to do it for every single uh, situation. Some of them have screws. Some of them have push buttons that you need to do, and then it opens up. Some of them are a clamshell design, which means it's kind of like a U-shaped case, and you slip it off, and you can see both sides. It just depends. So feel free to look at your manufacturer documentation to find out how you open the case. A lot of them do have these screws, as this picture shows. You just loosen the screw here, you loosen the screw here, and then you're able to pop it off. Uh, but again, everyone's a little bit different. When you get inside uh, your case, remember you want to avoid this ESD, electrostatic discharge. We talked about three different options. One of them was touching the metal case every now and then to offset your electrostatic discharge within your body so you don't ruin the RAM or the CPU or things like that that are very important or the motherboard. Another way is just to uh, occasionally touch the power supply, which is what the left picture shows. Again, that will also offset the electrostatic discharge. Or if you never want to just keep touching things to, to offset your ESD, you can use an anti-static wrist strap. You put it on there, you clip it onto the metal case, and then you can keep working without having to keep touching the metal parts of the computer. 
when you are cleaning inside, again, you might see some cobwebs or different things, you're, you can use some compressed air, which is basically a special can of air designed to blow out aimed air. Uh, just be sure to use it outside when using it. It's gonna kick up a lot of dust and a lot of different things. And so we wanna make sure that doesn't fall back inside your house uh, and ruin your air quality, it falls outside. So uh, using compressed air is great. You can also use a specialized anti-static vacuum. This is designed for electronics to vacuum out the inside of a personal computer. Normal vacuum cleaners will create static electricity, especially when you're looking inside of the case. You've got to be very careful not to do that. These anti-static vacuums do not use uh, electricity, rather they use batteries or something that you can charge. So it's not just con constantly plugged in, which just has electricity flowing throughout it. Another thing to keep in mind is that we want to make sure that we have vent good ventilation for our, for our uh, computer tower and that there's dust and moisture control. Very important. Uh, when we're all done cleaning the inside of it, please make sure you keep your covers, uh, case covers in place. Uh, if they're not in place, the airflow within the case will be disrupted and may lead to some parts overheating. Not only do we want to keep the outside covers uh, in place, but we also want to keep these slot covers in place. This is where the expansion cards would stick out. And you can see the back of each of these expansion cards here. This is a network card. This looks like a, a video card with the different ports. And there's some other cards that you can use. So these other extra slot covers, which could be taken out to put for an ex expansion card, uh, if you don't have an expansion card, you want to leave those in place. Don't just leave an empty hole in here. Because again, that's going to actually, you would think, well, that's more ventilation. That's going to mess up the, the airflow that it's designed for. So make sure you keep everything in place and, uh, or, or that some things might overheat inside of your case. When a computer stops, stops working or you've replaced it and you're ready to uh, get rid of it, you can't just put it out in the trash. Some computers can get old, some computers are gonna be replaced and you don't need them anymore. I do recommend that you donate them if they're still in great working shape to a library or a school or someplace that needs it. But if it's broken and if there's some parts that are not working anymore, then again, you can't just put it in the trash. You will have to make sure that you are environmentally aware of how you can dispose of this computer. Uh, if you can recycle parts, maybe there's some parts of the computer that still work and you can use them yourself or you can donate them or sell them to other places. Uh, and, but most of these computers will contain some toxic materials. That is why we can't just put them in the trash. Uh, one of the things that, uh, that regulate these toxic materials and that make sure that you recycle these is something called the ROHS, and manufacturers have adopted this. ROHS stands for Restriction of Hazardous Substances. This is a standard that regulates toxic substances and allows computers to be made of more environmentally friendly parts. However, again, you still can't just trash it. We have to make sure we recycle it. And they have specialized electronic recycling facilities, uh, whether it's in your city or a city near you or a big city that you can drive to. This is a center that will take used electronics and dispose of them properly. Some specific component guidelines of the things that you might not need anymore and are looking to get rid of. Again, you can't just put these in the trash. One of them are those CRT monitors. Those are the things we talked about that are cathode ray tubes. These are those big, bulky, box-like monitors that are filled with all kinds of toxic chemicals like lead and phosphorus and mercury. Again, you can't trash those. You have to put them into a special recycling center so that way they can properly dispose of it. And remember, we never want to open those on our own because it could lead to um, some, some possible health issues. The ne next one is scanners and printers. And it's, again, if these are still working great, feel free to find someone who still needs it. You can even put it on Facebook or Craigslist and say it's for free if you're not looking to get any money. These are not typically too toxic. And so if they're still work great, you, know, you shouldn't have a problem getting rid of these um, or just put them in a garage sale. Uh, batteries, it depends on what we have. Alkaline batteries are typically okay to trash, but in California, you actually have to recycle them. That's a state mandate thing. Uh, but regular batteries, you can just throw away. However, there are some recycling centers that also take regular batteries. 
Uh, I've even known of Walmart being able to take these batteries because they will dispose of them properly. However, if they are rechargeable batteries, batteries that you put in a little case and then plug in, those cannot be just thrown away. Those will require some special recycling centers. There's some chemicals and things inside of a rechargeable battery that could be hazardous to the environment. For ink and toner, uh, leftover ink from an inkjet printer or toner from a laser printer that you don't need anymore, again, it, you can't just throw these away. These are toxic if you're tossed, so you would take them to the recycling center as well. And finally, hard drives, and we're talking about the magnetic hard drives, the HDDs, the ones that spin, uh, you actually should, I would recommend that you trash them before you trash them. And what I mean by that is that you are trying to destroy the content on that. And you can, you know, you can do whatever you can to that hard drive through the computer. Uh, you can um, uh, try to format it if you want. It's not necessarily going to get rid of everything. So what I personally do is I completely ruin it and so it can't be read anymore. And one of the ways that I do that is I just simply take a drill with a drill bit on the end and I drill multiple holes through the spinning disc that's inside of the uh, hard drive. And then I would take it to a recycling center because you don't want people to get on there and find confidential information. It will protect your privacy if, uh, if you do trash it before you trash it, if that makes sense. Uh, the last thing that we need to talk about today is disaster recovery. Now, you know, unfortunately, disasters are going to hit, whether it's an individual computer or a whole network and a whole building full of computers. So there's these two things under disaster recovery that are important to know. Incident response plan, also abbreviated as IRP, are detailed directions when negative incidents occur. These are typically what you have in place before the negative incidents occur. And you want to make sure you assess the situation, you determine how bad the situation is, and then you prioritize incident response activities. Uh, this outlines what to do in order to look at the situation and figure out what, uh, what the best course of action is. And they do have escalation procedures, which means they continue to go up and up and up to a more, um, more uh, critical uh, situation. And the other type of recovery plan is a disaster recovery plan. So if a disaster happens, you want a DRP on file, which you should have in place before these negative things happen. And this is a detailed procedure to help keep the downtime for that computer network to a minimum. Uh, and we want it to have the least minimal impact if a uh, disaster happens to happen within a building or within a network. So incident response plan is one specific incident. Disaster recovery plan is what happens if a whole building is affected. How do, we, how do we recover from that? And so both of these plans should be in place prior to the incident or prior to the disaster happening. All right, that's it. Uh, again, a, kind of a short lesson this time with Chapter 12, dealing with, um, dealing with everything we just talked about. Let's go ahead and look at some review questions. Now, on these review questions... Uh, again, this covers everything that we just talked about, and uh, feel free to look back and review the video um, that I, we just did, and then you can possibly answer some of these questions. Pause this video at any time if you want to answer these questions first before you uh, find out what the uh, answers are. Number one, in sleep mode, the blank remains powered, but everything else shuts off. Is it A, the hard drive, B, the monitor, C, the memory, or D, CPU? In sleep mode, remember this sleep mode uses a little bit of electricity to keep the memory powering. So the answer is C. Remember the memory has to keep powering because that's what holds the projects and the documents and the things that you're working on. It holds that in place. If it just shut off, you would lose everything that you were working on. So memory remains powered, but everything else shuts off. Number two, how long can a laptop remain in hibernate mode without running out of battery power? A, 36 hours, B, 12 hours, C, it depends on the battery condition and capacity, D, indefinitely. Please remember that hibernate mode is when it writes the memory to the hard drive and then everything shuts off. So how long can a laptop remain in hibernate mode without running out of battery power? Forever. So the answer is D, indefinitely. Hibernate mode uses no power at all. Number three, how should you clean removable media such as a DVD? 
A, use a soft cloth and wipe with a circular movement, movement. B, use a soft cloth and wipe inside to outside with a straight movement. C, use a soft scrub brush and wipe left to right. And D, put the disc in a dishwashing machine. I'll give you a hint, it's not D. Uh, the answer, again, remember for a DVD, is that you want to go from the inside to the outside straight out. Again, it seems counterintuitive, but that is the best way to clean a DVD or a Blu-ray or a CD. Number four, Rich has inherited a computer that used to live in his uncle's machine shop. What should he use to clean up parts such as the case, keyboard, and mouse? A, a dry soft cloth. B, a soft cloth with distilled water. C, a soft cloth with mild soap and water. D, a soft cloth with a commercial cleaning solution. We are going to assume that his uncle's machine shop is a dirty environment. And with a dirty environment, if you wanna clean up these parts that they have mentioned, you would wanna use mild soap and water and your soft cloth. Cause it's gonna have some grime, some aggressive grime that you're gonna really have to dig down and clean. Number five, what standard offers computer part makers guidelines for making environmentally friendly parts? A, FTC, B, R, I, A, A, C, R, O, H, S, D, V, H, S. The answer is C, R, O, H, S. And remember that stands for Restriction of Hazardous Substances. Number six, what can you use to prevent ESD from damaging components when cleaning inside of a computer? A, anti-static wrist strap, B, anti-static bag, C, anti-static wipe, D, ESD presents no danger to components, so nothing special is needed. To prevent ESD of these options, A is the best. They could have also mentioned touching the metal case or touching the power supply unit. Number seven, why should you, uh, excuse me, what should you use to remove dirt? What should you use to remove dust and animal, animal hair from inside a computer case? A, a blow dryer, B, compressed air, C, household vacuum cleaner, D, mild soap and water. From inside a computer case, you gotta be really careful with the ESD and the electricity that you have around it. And also you don't want it to uh, possibly get wet. So of these options, compressed air is the best. Blow dryer would have electricity, vacuum cleaner would have electricity, soap and water is bad. You don't want to get wetness and moisture inside of your case. Number eight, what problem can missing slot covers on the case cause? A, electromagnetic interference from other electronics nearby. B, electrostatic discharge from dust and animal hair. C, disruption of airflow inside the computer leading to overheating. D, disruption of airflow outside the computer leading to overheating. The reason we leave so slot covers on is because there is going to be a disruption of airflow inside the computer and that could possibly lead to overheating. Number nine, what computer component contained a lot of lead and must be recycled? A, CRT, B, toner cartridge, C, ink cartridge, D, hard disk drive. The component that has a lot of lead that must be recycled of this list, the one that has a lot of lead is the dangerous CRT, along with mercury and phosphorus and other hazardous chemicals. Number 10, in California, how should small alkaline batteries be disposed of? A, regular trash, B, recycling center, C, incinerated, D, any of the above. California, again, has laws against uh, regular alkaline batteries, so we would want to take them to the recycling center. You cannot just throw them in the trash. Finally, number 11, what type of contingency plan is specific to an IT system or service? A, business continuity, B, incident response, C, disaster recovery, D, data restoration. For an IT system or service, we're talking about the entire IT system within a building, within a corporation, within a business. So we would classify this as not one incident, but an entire disaster. So this is disaster recovery. All right, great. Again, that's it for chapter 12, a short chapter this time. Uh, meet us, uh, join us next time for chapter 13. We are getting closer and closer to the end of this. 
And, uh, and again, if you have any questions or comments, feel free to put them down below. I'll happy to answer anything that you put. Um, and I appreciate you watching the video, and we will see you next time for Chapter 13. As always, keep on keeping on.